Wonderful. Yeah, I see it's rolling. I mean, is it rainy? Mm -hmm. We already have a comment, too. All right. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Somebody's on a timeline. We got to get to getting. AI is still hot. Chat GPT is hot. Everyone's having shows. Kind of coming old to release some really devastating news yesterday, 800 million or something like that in losses of readjusting their financials. Mm -hmm. um, what else is going <laughs> I'll tell you what. This year has gone by so fast. It's May already, and it's going to be June. It's going to be halfway done. It's, gonna be done. it's crazy. Yeah. So um, Kelly Stone is the guest today and I you know I'm gonna have you introduce yourself well actually Kelly I'm gonna introduce you and then you can fill in the blanks because okay I you know I want to give him what I know and then um, <laughs> detail but we got a lot of cool stuff to talk about yeah um, and here we are hey hey so Kelly I know I well maybe you should so Kelly is a marketing person and the whole reason that I – well, one of the biggest reasons I connected with her is because of the AI thing and marketing and ChatGPT, and she's, she's using it a lot and stuff like that. So I wanted to get, get have a conversation um, about that, but also technology because, what, you were at CompTIA, right? That's correct? Or yes, I, I was. Now I am an independent marketing professional, and I think what has – been the thread throughout my career is emerging technology. There's always something new. There's always something to learn in marketing. And we're at the beginning of a revolution that has just started. Right. I know. It's cool. Another huge revolution, too. So here's my connection with um, CompTIA. And I don't know if I had this conversation with you before. So I was the president of the MPSA, Management Services Association, 100 million years ago, right? A long time ago, it seems. Um, and when I was the president, my whole goal was to connect and um, interface with IT because we were copier guys, right? We were mm -hmm. copiers, blah, 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 blah. I came out of the IT world and jumped into the copier side and, wa and saw management services as a bridge over. So we started a relationship with CompTIA during my administration. West McDonald was part of the CompTIA side. And um, we went, you know, attended each other's shows. But one of the biggest things I remember is we went through the uh, – MPS certification thing. And yes. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, three days, two days, I don't even remember. Locked in a room, putting mm -hmm. together the testing, the crazy, all that stuff. I mean, it sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting to somebody. Yeah, I'm just kidding. It was a blast. I mean, we, you know, what was really good about it. It took a long time because we had so many mm -hmm. people involved. And we think, thank right. goodness we had a bunch of people on the copper side, but the IT mm -hmm. side. Yeah. That was just four or five years ago. I don't know. Were you involved with CompTIA back then? You must have been, right? No? Yes, for sure. Okay. I was right. I was with CompTIA for eight years. So we oh. saw a lot of interesting, cool things. And I think about all the innovation that happened in the last decade. I can't imagine what the next decade is going to look for, look like for the industry. It's going to be nuts. So give me a feel for how much you're using. Uh, and I'm guessing it's ChatGPT, right? It came out at the end of November. Mm-hmm. Um, daily, hourly? What, what's your cadence on that app right now? How, how often are you into it? And I'm using it quite a bit. And I find it interesting to organize my thoughts and to polish things. So I think that it's not cheating by any means. I think that it's using the tools that are available to you to create better outcomes. And that's always the dream for any marketer is to get the right amount of MarTech tools to create the best outcomes. Specifically, like what kind of, you say tools, and, and give me an example of what you would use it for. Just, well, I've got a million, but what, what do you, you know, like what did you do this morning? What, what, Help me write a proposal. Oh, really? Help me develop a 90-day plan. Break it down for every week of the first 90 days. Help me uh, develop some keywords. 
what are some hashtags that I should be using for LinkedIn posts for this vertical? Or, you know, I was just seeing another influencer talking about it today and what she suggested, and I find this to be brilliant, is take a job description, put that in chat GPT and say, write me the most common questions for this job description as well as their answers, and then develop a resume with keywords based on this description. Okay. So you reverse engineered it, actually. I mean, is that a way to look at it? If I was looking for a job, then you mm -hmm. you asked G chat GPT to give me the requirements and then build something that matches those requirements. Is that Precisely. So the only way that you're going to beat the computers, the applicant tracking system, in my opinion, is to use a computer to beat it. Uh, right. Because, you know, your resume never sees a person if you can't get it past those screenings. It's crazy. Right. Way, it is. Think of those things. What do you think of those uh, computerized resume sorter things? I don't know. I'm really conflicted about it, honestly, because we all know that there's a lot of bias in hiring because you're going to be naturally drawn to hire somebody who looks and sounds like you. That's human nature. So theoretically, the applicant tracking system could remove this, but also employers need to be realistic about what they want. We've all joked about how a new tool comes out and all of a sudden people want 10 years of experience in it when the developer itself doesn't have 10 years of experience in it. So it's just a hellscape that you have to use new tools to get around. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I've tried to use ChatGPT to write content that can't be detected by AI. So I'll give them that prompt, and sometimes it works. It usually doesn't. Those, and those AI, so the way I use it is basically the same thing. What, here's mm -hmm. what I've been really diving into is taking mm -hmm. existing content, say a Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. This is going to sound bad. Take a Wall Street Journal um, article that I know someone mm -hmm. spent a lot of time on and wrote. And it's behind a paywall, but I have a subscription. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. So I grab the content, run it through chat GPT, add my own paragraph or two at the beginning, you know, my reflections, inflections, whatever you want to call it. And then by a formula of output from the prompt that I've developed mm -hmm. over the last couple of months, out comes a summary article. That is, I mean, you know, we're only talking, I hate to say this against, it's copyrighted. It isn't, yeah. you know. Gone with the wind or the three musketeers. This is just copywriting. Mm -hmm. And even at that level, I think Chat GPT uses way too many adverbs. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, by the way, do you have an adult beverage? Because I'm going to get one. Okay. We're doing this, son. I do. I do. Excellent. Let's yeah. Do a... I was just waiting to see if we were drinking for this. I should. I guess I should have asked that at the beginning. So, we are drinking for this. Cheers. Happy Friday. Oh, my gosh. Happy Friday. We made it. <laughs> so I've kind of developed a system in my mind of how to get ChatGPT to understand what I'm going to talk about and then produce good results. So mm -hmm. I'll go in there and I'll start a new conversation with it. And I'll basically feed it every piece of source material that I have. So pretend that I am the technical advisor for this windshield company. Here's what I know about the product. Here's what I know about the role. Here's what I know what the goals are. And I enter that in and then it'll spit it back to me and say, you are the technical advisor for a windshield wiper company. What can I help you with today? And then okay. you can go through and say, I'm having a supply chain issue. What, what are my next moves to secure the correct materials or whatever the thing is? But I keep all of those companies and projects separately so that if I want to go back and say, you know what, I really liked how it solved that supply chain issue. I can say today's problem is X, Y, Z, and it has that foundational knowledge that I built with it before. Right. So when you say, you, do you save the prompt and the results all on um, uh, chat GPT or do you, you know, that's, where you, that's what you're talking about, the saved conversation, yep. right? Yep. I'm keeping all of those threads separate. Which is, that's a new thing that I've kind of learned the last couple of weeks is going mm -hmm. back. And it is just like, it, you know, I don't know, the, the memory doesn't fade. So even the right. mind heads, it's like, what the hell was I talking to this? But I go back and it'll pick it up right from there. Um, right. Which, of course, it's kind of obvious. Of course it does. because I, I never really put that together. Um, so I mean, how that is important. <laughs> and how many different episodes of Black Mirror do you think that we can talk about today? Because, of course, there's that episode where everyone has the grain implanted and then they're reliving their memories exactly as they happened, which 
I would argue my generation is the first one doing that from VHS tapes to social media and just reliving these memories as they happen. But of course, there's the Black Mirror episode where she rebuilds her boyfriend based on his social media presence and their chat log, except the robot isn't the same. Right. Wow. Right. I'm just looking at parallels with the X-Files, which a whole nother thing, right? That, that's a whole, yes. nother, a whole nother thing. Um, wow. Okay. And I think the reason why Black Mirror is terrifying is because it's just this close to technology, whereas X-Files felt so far out there. Well, that's even, all right. We'll talk about X Files. Yeah, it did, mm -hmm. and that was part of the entertainment. It's like, yeah, right. But now, right. I mean, I just saw someone posted a par part of an X, one of the last two seasons, and mm -hmm. they're going on and on about something. And I'm going, holy crap, that's what this is. And I'm just, yeah, I'm just like, how the, that's nuts. Now, there's a whole another conspiracy about that, but we'll, we'll mm -hmm. stay on track here for now. <laughs> um, so we're talking about okay, so. Talk to me about your evolution of prompts. How yes. do you go about doing it? Now, I'll share with you what I do, but how mm -hmm. do you evolve your prompts? I mean, if, go ahead. How do you do that? I mean, I think when I first started using it, I was using it as a Google substitute. So how to take care of a Christmas cactus. You know, very rudimentary things. But then it occurred, I think I watched a YouTube video where somebody was explaining that you can ask it to write in the style of any figure that it has enough so source material for. So I can ask it to create a sonnet about Taco Bell in the style of Shakespeare, for example. And that, in so my you opinion, did that too, didn't you? You did that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, but I guess I should. I mean, I do love Taco Bell a lot and I, I would love to know. It's hilarious. I put Shakespeare on copier. I put Shakespeare on mm -hmm. toner. I put Shakespeare yeah. on all sorts of stuff. And it was Wes who did it because, you know, I didn't make it talk to me like Shakespeare. I go, Ooh, I'm going to mm -hmm. do that. Um, yeah. I did Walter Cronkite. Mm, so, that's a good one. In the style of Walter Cronkite. Give me a newscast. Blah, 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 blah. Um, How about in the style of Dave Chappelle? I know. That's, that's an option. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I did Sam Kinison. Um, mm -hmm. and that, but that's an excellent point because – the style of, you can do the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. the New Yorker, you know, Reader's Digest. You can go on and on and on. And then, right. what, what's its act? And, of course, you probably, I didn't, my schooling was business. And, actually, I went, <laughs> went back before there was any, there was no such thing as MIS. There was, it was mm -hmm. IT. It was, and it, it was yeah. technology. And when I got to college, they had just moved out the data card computer system. So mm -hmm. we didn't use cards. We but we had to go yeah. to the big glass bed, uh, uh, glass room, and you had to compile all your programming and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have any journalism or anything like that. I, I did all that in high school, and I don't even know where I was going with this. But um, oh, this for me the personal journey with this is really learning a lot about writing and journalism from mm -hmm. a technical standpoint, right? Not just right. My writing thus far. It's all been on the creative side. And then I look back at my personal, it's like, I, well, why did I go in this direction? I took every single writing and creative writing and English class in high school. Every single one. I forgot all about it. You know, I was a football player. Because you know, we mm -hmm. they were easy. Whatever. Um, yeah. And anyway, full circle. But what it's taught me is really what, in my opinion, is what journalism is about. There's a lot of structure. There's, you know, I didn't know about the different types of structure writing an article i just wrote yeah it based on what i knew um and then what it's really done for me is point out maybe you'll like this maybe you won't is how bad journalism is now it's like yeah it's not i picked something out of the wall street journal the other day I go, this is not journalistic formula this is not what are you guys doing and i, I alluded to it with the right. uh, adverb the thing what is that doing? There's a lot to break down there. So there are fewer journalists today than there ever were before. And it's really difficult to incentivize people to go into journalism when a good paying journalism job still doesn't pay you enough to live outside of your parents' house. So I speak from personal experience. I like to say I didn't leave newspapers. They left me. I mean, I got a master's degree in journalism and oh. I was like, sleeping on my friend's couches. It it was not a sustainable career. So there's that. I think that there is a war on journalism, on quality journalism. We're seeing that politicians are not seeing journalists as the fourth estate 
as they were designed. They're seeing them as the enemy, which has far reaching impacts on our democracy. I interject that some of them even see them as an ally. And that's almost as dangerous. <laughs> that's what I'm it's like, okay, right. That's not the fourth estate. I mean, that, that's not from what I understand about it. Yeah. Interesting. So what I said in grad school, and I still very, feel very strongly, is that journalists will always have jobs. They're just going to look different. So, you know, there is a format. And there's a certain thing in um, – in journalism, where you had to write headlines and measure them all out, there was a joke that there's a poem hidden in every newspaper in the headlines. And the reason why it worked is when you're constrained creatively, you can make something out of anything. So the format of journalism stories is so that it, they're easy to follow along so that your reader knows what to expect. But keep in mind, your average newspaper is written at an eighth grade level. So there's that aspect. Um, you know, I went to journalism school when social media was a thing that kids did, not a thing that businesses did. And that was the next parlay into that world is how do you tell a story in 140 characters? How do you use these tools to get in front of the right people and make them care? Right. So I would I would put forward that that belief right there is a journalistic belief where I think it really did shift is into how can I get as many eyes on what I'm throwing out there, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's yeah. the average point. And again, Walter Cronkite versus Peter Jennings versus Christian, you know, anyone today. When when the in my when the announcer or the delivery of the information becomes part of the story, that's that's not journalism to me. I mean, maybe that's me. And I'm I'm just an end user. I'm a guy who digests mm -hmm. it. All right, I'm just a dude who goes, eh, well. And I look at everyone else, and I go, that's not a news story. And I could, I don't, it doesn't matter what it is, but it was presented as quote unquote neutral and it certainly isn't it's spun all over the place does, left or right it doesn't matter and now i think the gen you know, like eighth grade readers the general public the mass take mm -hmm. that as news and it is it's almost like gospel and and i find that to be well that's disturbing to me you mentioned it i mean it, right um and what's interesting now is I hear, okay, I could go back to the days, well, Watergate, that was busted open because of good journalism. And then I mm -hmm. heard some other things the other day, it's like, well, maybe it wasn't. So what, what do you mean? There was, you know, people were after Nixon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are you saying? They leveraged, yeah. Oh, all right. Well, that's an interesting theory. I didn't think about that. But um, I didn't know you had the master's in journalism. So then I want to explore yeah. that even more. Mm -hmm. How, because ChatGPT is on four, and there's a lot more to come. Mm -hmm. Where do you think this impacts journalism is, and, and print in, in content gen on a universal thing? A universal I am so, I'm so glad that you asked me about that because I was reading this story that horrified me on so many levels of a woman who was engaged in an interview with a subject source who overcame breast cancer and had this story. And the long and short of it is she found out that she wasn't interacting with a real person. She was interacting with a ghost who had an AI generated headshot, not dissimilar to the ones that are on this thumbnail and was using this as a vehicle to include her blog, which was one of those like spammy, you know, click to enter sort of things. So I think there are a couple of things to pull out of this. I don't think me media literacy is taught at all anymore. And I don't, I think that we can all retreat into our echo chambers in a way that previous generations really couldn't, which is why Man. in 2016, the election was such a shock to so many people because they were only seeing media sources that they were being fed. I don't know if you ever read Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, but the idea is that as an antidote to 1984, where the things that terrify us kill us, we're instead of living in a brave new world where the things that amuse us are suffocating ourselves. So we're creating this reality that isn't real through the communications, through the tools, through the things that we're being fed. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's excellent. Yeah. So the echo chamber that we naturally grab and, mm -hmm. and I think it's, goes it's a it's a result of i don't know what it's uh, we don't want conflict and we define conflict now conflict is so talking is a conversation with someone who has not e just a different view it doesn't have to be an mm -hmm. alternate view to what you say it's black it's white no it's, i think it's great mm -hmm. well you're crazy there's none of this right 
and this brought me up, uh, brought up when ChatGPT first came out, and I, I poo pooed it. Eh, whatever, it's <laughs> another, it's another thing. And I'm looking at it. Go, oh, wait a minute, man. Oh wow, it brings out, it, it forces everyone, I think, to be more critical. And I think that critical thinking, and I, I almost penned, I'm partially through a, on our, uh, a, a piece on that, is that it brings us maybe to rediscover. Socrates and the fact, you know, the way to think. The method, they, yes. The method. Uh -huh. They don't teach that anywhere. I mean, no. I barely got it, and that was back in the, you know, I mean, it, it was well. But anyway, they don't teach how to think. They teach what to think, I think. Does that make sense? And that's actually part of the communications theory that is part of that book, is that the media doesn't tell you what to think, but they are telling you what to think about. So the things that get chosen – to be featured means oh, other yeah. things aren't chosen. So no newspaper is going to sell a million copies with the headline, the sun rose today. You might sell a million copies if you're like, airplane goes down in fiery crash and it was a conspiracy and on and on and on. You know, it, it's unfortunate. And this has been the case for generations that bad news sells. Yeah, it bleeds, it leads and stuff like It bleeds, that. it leads. Right, exactly. And the media literacy part of it is so critical. And I just don't think it's something that we think about, even though I feel like it's been, it's so much more important because kids today have access and are inundated with so much information that they don't necessarily even shut out at any point. I mean, you could scroll on TikTok endlessly and just consume, consume, consume. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think I have. <laughs> so to my good friend, Barry, who's out in London, it looks like he's, he's a high school buddy. Real old school. Good to thanks, Barry. Nice to see you. <laughs> Haven't seen him in years. Welcome, Barry. welcome. Welcome, welcome from Charlie old London. Um, <laughs> okay, so rolling. Okay, we got AI. We've got the journalistic mm -hmm. challenge. We've got when you say was it media studies or what? It isn't taught. Uh, that's for us on the consuming side, right? We we just don't. Right. Talk about the, okay. We don't think about. I think about when my kids were little, when they had to learn what a lie was. Because there's this point in childhood where everything that they've heard is the first time they've ever heard it. So idioms, exaggeration, hyperbole, none of it means anything to them until they learn that skill. What happens if that skill ends at deciding whether or not someone is lying? What if it doesn't translate into taking a critical eye at the things that we're consuming? Wow. Okay. Because it's just not taught. It's just not taught how to read a document and tell the difference between opinion and fact. So I wonder how QVC is doing these days as kids discover infomercials and don't understand that it's all garbage. <laughs> well, that's terrible. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. Wow. And I, wow. So. No, I'll tell a story. Yes. I, I will tell a story. So. Uh, for those of you watching who are in the United States who don't know, Mother's Day is on Sunday. So like, get that together. It, it, the time is wasting. But the reason I bring this up is year, I am a stepmother. My kids are now step, uh, my stepkids are now 11 and 13. Uh, my oldest had a unit in school where they read fairy tales and she came home and she was fired up, fired up because they read Cinderella and they're like, Kelly there's a stepmother and she is evil. She poisons Cinderella with a poison apple, or maybe it was Snow White, but she was just fired up about the idea. And nobody else in her class got that point because they had never interacted with step parents. And it's just like, if these kids don't have a frame of reference to ask questions about what they're consuming, whether it's as inconsequential as this or as consequential as election results, we just don't know the right questions to ask. Right. So that, wow. So I always go back to what was it, ninth grade. I think it was ninth. It could have been eighth. Well, here, here's how old this is. When I was in eighth grade, there were two classes, boys lit and girls lit. Okay. So yes. Oh, so that was back then. <laughs> tell me more about this. Tell me more about this lawsuit. <laughs> Potentially legally actionable item. Can't wait. Oh, no, it was, and we weren't the only, it was, it was, it was, it was the way it was. Oh, I got other stories that just, anyway, mm -hmm. so Boys Lit was uh, The Outsiders, um, you know, all these hot rod summer, 
and you've read books and girls lit. I don't mm -hmm. know. I think it was Little Women. I mean, I'm just kidding. I know, I know, I know. Um, but I had a debate. Lots to break down there. <laughs> <laughs> Water under the bridge, because I'm sure it's no longer there anymore. No. Uh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't. But we had a debate class, and I took the debate class in junior and high school, like that was eighth and ninth grade, and then eleventh mm -hmm. and twelfth. Okay, and I love this example. I don't even. I first of all, it's terrifying. All right, well, you're a kid. You know. I mean, all right, we're gonna yeah. get up in front of the class, and you go, wait, wait, what? Yeah, we're all gonna. <laughs> Okay, and there's going to be different formats, but you're going to have to present blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here were the subjects. I still remember this. It was uh, Quinlan, which was uh, euthanasia, which doesn't have anything to do with young kids in Korea. Um, what? Uh, capital punishment, nuclear power, and save the whales or something like that. Environmental, you know, those were the subjects that I just remember. Oh, abortion was the big back then. They couldn't and have started with like paper versus plastic, organic no, versus conventional. Of course. Whew. There was cool. We've got like Supreme Court level stuff here for seventh graders. I know. It's well, yeah, but that was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we didn't do paper plastic. We went dove right in. But what I remember distinctly, first of all, it was terrifying. And yeah, you had to get up. Mm -hmm. and everyone was. That was the only good thing is like everyone was nervous as hell. You had your three mm -hmm. by five card. And, um, you know, towards the end of the semester, it's like, OK, we're just going to debate. Here's your subject, research it, and they would do this. You come into the class, grab a subject, do your research right now. And of course, there's like a newspaper or a mag, you know, yeah, the world that. book. Yeah, the world book, the encyclopedia. Uh -huh. You got 20 yeah. minutes to research. You know, pick whatever side you want. 20 minutes to research. Da -da 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 -da, mm -hmm. And then we'll we'll do the first ones. You know, right after that. Okay. So who are you? You pro? Yeah. Okay. You're con. All right. All right. All right. Okay. You guys got all your arguments. Okay. On the way up to the podium. Oh. Oh. Wait. Switch. Hmm? <laughs> You oh my gosh, this time. is traumatic. Gosh, this time. is where my anxiety started. No. <laughs> I know. But, and it was dastardly, right? It's like, oh yes. my God, what a buzzsaw. It's like, okay, you got five minutes to collect your thoughts, but you guys have switched sides, switch arguments. But, but, oh my God, how valuable was that? It's like, all right, yeah. well, next time, right? Okay, mm -hmm. here's the subject, pick your side. Well, he's going to switch it up again. So I got to know both right. sides. And that empathetic approach right there was mm -hmm. perfect. Absolutely perfect. And I challenge everyone now and then I'll be in a conversation. They're trying to sell me something. Okay, that sounds mm -hmm. good. Well, tell me why I shouldn't buy this. Give me some reasons why. And it, mm -hmm. they don't know. But, but you know, that's, that to me was great. And I don't think we do that anymore, right? Or we just get mad and no. call each other names and go off to our own little echo chamber. Which sucks. And we retreat. Yeah. We retreat and no growth comes from retreating. And I think the research aspect is interesting because, you know, I certainly grew up where you had to go to the library and use the world book. And I remember Ask Jeeves was the big search engine for a while. Wow. And then I can distinctly remember a time I was in debate and we were after school in the computer lab because I didn't, I had a computer at home, but I don't know that I had free access to the internet. Google had just come online and they had to teach us how to use Google, right. what it meant to do search terms with quotes, pluses versus minuses, what a Boolean search means. And I think that's where AI is right now. We need to teach people and learn how to use the tool so that we're learning, we're working aside it instead of against it. Google didn't, didn't kill the library. AI is not going to kill the content creator. It's going to make us all more efficient. Right. So even to swerve into that, because what's happening now, what, what I feel coming up is this all this regulation of AI movement, mm. right? And I right now, and I, it, could, it will change, but right now mm -hmm. I am an anarchy. I am an AI anarchist right now. I mm -hmm. don't want anyone. I don't care who it is because, A, I don't trust anyone right now. I sure as hell right. don't trust Google. Are you kidding me? They killed the Internet to, my, mm -hmm. to me. I remember, you know, yeah, Ash Cheese, who was the other one? Lyra, Lycra, whatever. There were these other services. Dogpile. There were a ton of them. Right? I remember all of them. Yeah. You could, you could actually put it, and what would come back would be like these white papers from some of these scientific studies. But that was raw data. That it wasn't right. filtered. It wasn't what I was really looking for. No, I wasn't looking for mm -hmm. an advertisement. I was looking for why satellites don't fall or whatever it is. Right. Um, so right now, I am a pure anarchist. It, it, mm -hmm. Here's my other thing. Everyone says, well, AI, if AI were going to destroy us, we would be gone. Because right yes. now, everyone seems to forget. 
that, yeah, we're all, this is a mass appeal of AI. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1964, someone, the government, had technology that could read license plates from a satellite. No one even thought about that, right? Mm -hmm. So if we've got AI, chat, GPT, I'm sure someone somewhere is going, oh, that's really quaint and cute, but we've progressed 15 years from there right now. Right. My thought is if AI were going to kill us, it would have done it already. That's the way I look at it. So, and, and yeah. until there's a body of someone that I say, yeah, you know what? Okay, I'll give it. They can mm -hmm. do whatever they got to do with AI to regulate it. But until then, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't trust anyone right now. What do you think? I think it's interesting because when we go back to that communications theory option, we know that the way that Google displays information to us is not non-biased, and right. it very much shapes how we perceive the world. So their search engine optimization is changing. It used to be very much keyword based, which was easy to win. You figured out how to use those keywords, where to put them, how to hide them in the margins, things like that. Right. But now it's far more intent based. So the AI is trying to understand what the intention of your search is rather than just the keywords. So, you know, Google is evolving, but it is also very much shaping how we experience the world, whether you like it or not, it just is. And I think it's very easy to pretend like we haven't had AI in our homes interacting with it for a very long time. If you have a smart speaker, that is AI. If you have, you know, Amazon delivery where they can deliver inside your home, obviously there's a lot of elements to that. And all of these are incremental progress towards being okay with working alongside a robot. And that's happened forever. Right. Um, since the invention of the wheel, we've been wondering whether this will make humans obsolete. And clearly it isn't. We're here. Right, right. I heard a very interesting um, comment yesterday that the new programming language is, uh, well, the new code is language, and it's English right now. Mm -hmm. And, and some of the same guy said, well, you know, language was the very first technology. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Also, mm -hmm. to illuminate, the, the chat GPT isn't AI. And I think that's what people, it's like, it's not good, it's not the genie that can answer any question. Right. It's a large language machine model. And it, yes. It, it, and, it, and it hates to give you blank answers. So it will answer you most eloquently and completely inaccurate. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. that's the, oh, yeah. I, I learned it the hard way because it was quoting. I go, yeah, give me a quote from this article. And a quote would come up. And I did it. I don't even know. I went back and looked for the quote. It's not there. But, dude, yeah. I, I almost said this. Dude, <laughs> is that a real quote? My apologies. No, it was not a real quote. What the heck? <laughs> okay. So now. Yeah. Give me a real quote from the content that I just mm -hmm. pasted into your whatever into the prompt. Now it works. But right. I think I went for a few days just trusting the quotes and they weren't. They weren't and really that's good. the media literacy point. We need to train ourselves to be hyper vigilant of this stuff. It's very easy, especially now when I feel like I can Google anything that exists on earth. It's very easy to take that as gospel and it simply isn't. It makes the same mistakes that we do, and we're not willing to accept that the computers make mistakes. Oh, well, I could. Well, okay, that's a good. So, my computer training tells me that the computer will only do exactly what you tell it. Right. So, when I look back at the prompts, I never told it to give me a real quote. Mm, right, told, exactly. So, it's like, oh, it's back on me. So, I'm thinking now. Right. You got to narrow that in. But. And, and to your point that language was the first technology, there is an amazing museum in Bozeman, Montana, if anybody has ever been. And it is exactly, we're going deep cuts now. Yeah. Uh, I went to Bozeman a couple of years ago because deep in the pandemic, I wanted to go somewhere and I'm like, where can I take a direct flight? And I we wanted to go hiking. So we went to Bozeman, Montana. And of course it's Blizzard. So I'm like, what else is there to do in Bozeman, Montana? There is a computer technology museum in Bozeman, Montana. It's a small little facility. It is fascinating because it's really? not just old computers. It is, in their opinion, the beginning of computing, which was cuneiforms. So it goes way back oh. to creating symbols for language. Wait, 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 back up. Remind me again what those are. are those, those are like the scrolls where they would have like 
I don't know, it would look like a feather with a bird to represent things. Okay. And that's what they consider as the beginning of computing. And of course, they have like a collection of retired apples. They have a collect, they have the first digital camera that would take four photos that were like 0 0.02 megabytes. Like it is a fascinating place. They had the, um, the machines that would create the transcriptions during World War II. I spent hours at this place. It cost me $7 to get in. So well worth the trip. Yeah, excellent. They had the Enigma machine or? Enigma, that's what it is. Yes. And then they showed like the documentary behind it too. Fascinating stuff. Turin, he, you know, broke the code. That's mm -hmm. like that great movie. And then, yes. Wow. Totally Bozeman. recommend it. All right. Bozeman, Montana, also known as the heart of Yellowstone, both the show and the park. So really? that's what I did is I went out there to go to Yellowstone. Well, that's cool. All right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, so for what it's worth, it's amazing out there. Well, speaking of old technology. Mm-hmm. Oh, slide rule. Did, it, you know, did I pass? Did I pass the pass. test of knowing what well, it is? If you know how to use it, it would be even more impressive. But uh, I used to, but I don't no. anymore. Yeah, slide rule. I keep this right here. Got the typewriter yeah. in the back. Uh -huh. I don't know. Get old. Get in newspapers, out. we used pica poles to measure headlines. <laughs> Have you heard of the, those I've things? I've seen them, but I've never yeah. used them. I've watched it. What the hell? Yeah. Well, the whole typeface thing. The whole. Yes. You know, it blows my mind. I love it. We had to measure headlines to fit. <laughs> like, can you imagine somebody telling me I want six inches of copy on the latest village meeting? Like, what does that even mean? Right. No way. Well, it's like, where does the phrase copy and paste come from? Mm. Like, really? Or cut and paste. It was cut. And right. Paste. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love it. I, I tried to explain this when I was in college. Overnight, we went from a copy and paste newspaper at the college newspaper to Quark Express, which doesn't oh, exist wow. anymore, yeah. because something happened and we couldn't use the technology. And we were like, all right, we're doing it live. <laughs> doing it real. Oh, my gosh. That's yeah. Funny. Well, and I, now they don't even use that. Yeah. I used, we would, in college, we would put together flyers, but it was on a, mm -hmm. a copy machine. We did yeah. cut pictures of John Belushi or something out, mm -hmm. tape it paste it and then run copies mm -hmm. boom 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 black and white faded with the big line down the middle didn't matter that was back then. oh yeah that was fun. let me tell you my most important college memory as pertains to my career okay. my second year at bradley university because i only went there for three years i was working in the student newspaper and it was late and the photo editor was talking about the facebook oh. you needed a dot edu address to get in and you needed an invitation Michael Plona. I will never forget him. And I, he was like, ah, I'll send you an invite and it'll get you in. But like, don't bother. It is a total time suck. And I think of this conversation all the time because that one interaction was the beginning of my career in social media in 2007. <laughs> so I think about him and I think about this all the time. <laughs> don't do it. Absolutely. It's a total time suck. That's funny. That's hilarious. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Let's take uh -huh. All right. So that was yours. So my journey started with the MIRC, the ERC, the internet mm -hmm. relay chat. All right. Everyone yeah. thinks that the, some guy invented the pound, the hashtag. Mm -hmm. That's how everything was sorted on the IRC. And the IRC yeah. would have different chat rooms and it was pound sign public or politics pound. And that's mm -hmm. if you, your comment had that in front of it, you, yeah. all the other kinds. So that was a quote unquote, a room. And then AOL came out. Mm -hmm. AOL, for all its, and I don't think it had too many faults, but for all its things, you know, 50 million CDs were sent out. And they, mm -hmm. they at one point, considered every CD out as a, subs an, a user. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's one way to do it. I'm pretty that's sure there's somebody who got acquired by J.P. Morgan who got in, in trouble for a very similar thing recently, and I'm sure she's going to be incarcerated. But, yeah, you know, that's wonderful. math. It started back then, math. It's, it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, but I remember the early days of AOL, and it was because mm -hmm. you had CompuServe, you had Prodigy, and these mm -hmm. were like layers in between you and the interwebs, right? So mm -hmm. it wasn't as yeah. pro uh, C prompt driven. It was like a shell, like, oh, pretty pictures and all mm -hmm. this stuff. AOL really cracked the seal, though. For some reason, right. it took hold. And I remember being on mm -hmm. AOL 
with a bunch of what we we called ourselves hackers back then. We weren't hackers. We were just early adopters. Yeah. Um, and we were out there fooling around, just trying to find out stuff. And I remember mm-hmm. the day, and I don't, it must have been the day, I looked up at the list of people, and I, I don't know where I was. And all of a sudden I go, who are all these people that are online? And they were all, mm-hmm. this is not sexist, this is a, an observation. They were all housewives. They were mm. all, sta- when the stay at home or the, the housewives jumped into mm-hmm. AOL, it blew up. So it mm-hmm. went from, trading code on how to get into you know doom or whatever mm-hmm. game for free to exchanging recipes PTA yeah. discussions it went uh-huh. that's when i and i went boom well the wild wild west is over because look who's here and that's exactly right what happened. and so back to ai we are in the wild wild west now it's not gonna mm-hmm. take years i i don't well no i don't know because i think the, the world of zig and zag is going to be even faster now i think <laughs> I think if you if you look at the theory of entropy, the universe is always moving towards more chaos. And I feel like every technology is exponential. The number of the number of years that it took for radios to have mass adoption, totally different than the number of years that it took smartphones to have adoption. Uh, you ask a kid today about home phones, you're you're going to get an education. So. You want to have an AOL discussion. Um, we let our kid watch the Harry Potter movies when she uh-huh. finished reading the books. So we watched the trailer for the first Harry Potter movie. And it says at the end, search AOL keyword Harry Potter, keyword. which led to an absolute rabbit hole of explaining what the internet sounded like when I was in high school, trying to like sneak on and talk to my friends. They'll never know. They'll never know. They'll never know what it sounded like to hear robots scream as you connected to the internet oh and how <laughs> angry you would be if dad tried to call while you were on the internet. Right. Picked up the phone and you disconnected. What happened? Right. They will oh. never understand. Oh, my God. Well, someone yesterday, I think it was Wes, was talking about somebody put a dial-up phone in front of their kids and said, figure it out. And they had to figure it out how to make a call. A rotary, the whole thing. The yeah. The whole thing. And... Yeah, it's amusing, but I think as a kid, if you would have given me, I don't know, some sort of strange contraption that made food stay cold, I wouldn't know what the hell to do with it. You mean you put ice? What? Right. Like it, so. Oh, yeah. I can remember my first smartphone, and what's funny about it is I got a smartphone after I had de- been developing <laughs> – after I had been developing apps and QR codes – so I would develop, I would build all these things at my work computer. And then my boss had an iPhone. And when I was all done and I had everything ready, I would go and get her and be like, can you scan this and check it? Because I did not have an iPhone. And that was the only one that did that at the time. And we would joke of like, Melita has the, the Oracle, the Oracle will tell us. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh my God. Well, mm-hmm. talk about iPhones. I mean, I remember the first time I used a, 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 car, a car phone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and absolutely. Uh huh. It, it felt so uncomfortable to be mm-hmm. on the road in a car using yes. a phone at the uh-huh. same time. Going, are people looking at me like I'm weird because I'm on the, you know, and that was shattered, obviously, on and on. And kids can't even appreciate that, which is, you know, I'm not a crusty old guy. You know, get off my lawn. Mm-hmm. I kind of, well, no, I am. But, um, Whenever I hear myself say stuff like that, it's like I got to remind myself, well, there was something when you were a kid that, da, 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 yeah. you know, this is all new. But still, so let's swing back to AI yeah. and, and con- condensing of the evolution, right? Yes. Because literally, and if we take, obviously, ChatGPT came out the end of November, it's mm-hmm. May. Yeah. And there must be hundreds, there probably are thousands of APIs out there. Well, right. I, and here specifically, I find that there are people that are in it and they're off and mm-hmm. running and they're talking, you know, right. doing, and then there are people that aren't. Mm-hmm. And they're just going down the regular old, and my industry, our industry is, and this swings into the shows, right? All these new shows. Uh-huh. HP had a show, Sharp had a show, kind of whatever. They're all, they're all getting back. Oh, it's so good to see everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I took content from the Sharp show and I'll call them out. And I swear to God, you could take that and put it in 19, okay, 2005. And it would be relevant. It's like, mm. did we forget about what just happened? How can you do this? And they're acting like, here, 
this is what we're doing. We're back to normal. Uh, I don't know. What do you, I mean, what do you think about that? I think that when you look at the, so if you look at recent technologies, the amount of time that it took Facebook, for example, to get a hundred million users mm -hmm. compared to Instagram, compared to Snapchat, it's insane. YouTube has been around so much longer than people think about, and it is still evolving. And the amount of time that it took for them to get a hundred million users is really interesting. So I think that the progress and the path of progress will only increase. And I think that the ability to get in while the getting is good, like that window is probably closing. If you want to become an AI expert, if you want to become a chat GPT engineer, that window is starting to close. So you should get in on, on it now. Right. So that brings up a good question. What I want to, I got to remember, I want to talk about something else, but if uh -huh. you look at AI, what's a revenue model? Mm, yes. Okay. So this is very interesting to me because there's so many things out there where the revenue is not obvious. So Instagram, the revenue was not obvious to begin with. There has to be a revenue component. Otherwise it will not succeed. So yeah. in the social media world, there's so many sites that come and go that no one will ever remember because they weren't attractive to advertisers. So anybody mm -hmm. remember Google circles or Google oh, yeah. wave? Yep. Yeah, they were supposed to be the Facebook killers. Oof. And objectively, they were probably better than Facebook. Technically. They couldn't get people in there. Therefore, advertisers weren't interested. I can remember a point of panic at some point in the past where I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to get all of our assets set up on Parler because people are talking about this. Or Clubhouse or Signal or whatever. If that audience isn't interesting to advertisers, it will go nowhere. And it will just be spinning your wheels because honestly, there is a social media site for every interest group that's out there in the world. It doesn't matter what you're into. There's a social media site for it. And then there's one coming online every day. So that's an interesting point. And, and we've seen that a million times with the search engines, with the applications, with it, it happens all the time. Yeah. Even with Twitter. I remember the day Twitter became a thing. I think it was either the, the purple thumb or the floods in New York City. Somehow, because mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, yeah. everyone was getting their news from Twitter, and it was live, and it took, yeah. this this took place 15 minutes ago? Yeah, look at that. Wow. Yes, um, 100%. So, and there were others out there, right? Instagram, there were others. How, this is going to be a trick question. It's going to be a tough question. Mm -hmm. I look at, those were organically blown up somehow. Even TikTok mm -hmm. in its early days, somehow mm -hmm. it caught and I looked at, you know, you look to the younger kids because they ju they were on Instagram before anyone was on. They were on Facebook mm -hmm. before. Yeah. I mean, how do you even look at that to try and predict what the next thing is going to be? Do you? I, I, what do you think about that component? I love it, by the way. But what is your thing? Where are you at with that? It's always rolling the dice. So as a marketer, yeah. as a brand marketer, I go out there and I claim the name of my company on all these sites when they show up. And then I just don't do anything with it until I, because even if it's free, there's the human cost to creating all of these sites. Yeah. So there's that, but I feel like these technologies have had a moment. So even when I think back to texting, texting was possible for a really long time. In my opinion, texting only became a thing for my generation on September 11th because you could not get a phone call through. So all of a sudden, texting became big. And I can remember, I'm not sure which happened first. So historical buffs, call me out here. There were two historical events that I saw live on Twitter. And one was Osama bin Laden dying. And the other one was the Boston Marathon bombing. Those things played out live for me. I think that it's interesting in my opinion, that trauma has shaped a lot of these things of like, there's been something that happened that we needed these tools to survive. And all of a sudden they have entered the public consciousness and TikTok isn't similar. We needed it during the pandemic. Oh yeah. I mean, that's very interesting. So the, and the contrary to that, and I've got a whole other thread to go down. So when we were unaware of that, when those channels weren't open, when no, there wasn't that heavy degree of con con connectivity, mm -hmm. I suppose that incidents still took place. We just yes. didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. As an example, 
I think it was maybe, oh gosh, I say it was last year, but it's got to be five, six, seven years ago. There was the night of the tornadoes down in yeah. somewhere. They had mm -hmm. to, there was a big, a lot of tornadoes. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. That's all right. Then lately, now we've had a whole stream of tornadoes, right? We have all these tornadoes. My contention is, we don't have so many, you know what we have more of now? More weather stations. Right. I <laughs> bet you that in the 1800s, mm -hmm. there were nights of tornadoes all the time. Yeah. Normal. Now we see it. So now right. there's more of them? Uh, I don't know. Then you throw in, okay, this, if, if, that, if whatever issue I'm looking at happens to fit a certain narrative, boom, then it takes off. It's like, okay, there are, you know, whatever. There's more sunspots now. Well, we got more telescopes that can see sunspots. Right. You know, maybe, and I don't know. It's like the unexamined life, right? We have a 24-hour news cycle. And oh. as much as – exactly. So – I can remember I was at my grandparents' house years and years ago, and CNN was covering was a kid there. who had fallen through the ice in, like, central Wisconsin. And I'm like, there is nothing else going on in the world, clearly. But these become these – do you remember the balloon boy in Colorado, the kid who was, like, in a homemade balloon that apparently had taken off in Colorado? These things just exist because 24-hour news cycles exist. Right. Right. Well, they, yeah, yeah, you're right. So they exist. Mm -hmm. this, is, this gets into the metaphysical. Does it exist if we don't see it? If a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it? Yeah. Right. Once, once we observe it, we obviously, we change it. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole nother thing. Wow. Right. But I remember when CNN, for, it was like, who's going to watch news for 24 hours? Who's going to watch music for 24 hours? On TV? Oh, well, wow. music isn't on that show, at, or isn't on that station anymore at all. It's all trashy reality television. So, yeah. And I also remember re when reality TV became a thing and like I wasn't allowed to watch it because it was just so <laughs> weird and trashy and awful. And now it's like there's an I'm sure that there's a subscription service that you can buy to the idea of like we're shaping our worlds. I'm sure there's a subscription service that you can buy that is just that. Just like hmm. there's a subscription service that is just true crime. And how does that oh, yeah. shape your view of the world? Oh, boy. Well, boy, this is very interesting because so my mother is 83 years old. But she golf in the morning, tennis in the afternoon. I hope she gets May we all golf. be so lucky. Oh, my God. You, you have no idea. Um, <laughs> she's watching. All of these 2020s and all these crazy yes. shows. Uh -huh. And I know it's not impacting her, but I'm thinking mm -hmm. it is impacting. It's like, and, and, and it watch, is. I watch, she's watching all these shows where the wife kills the husband with you know, radiator fluid or rat poison. Mm -hmm. And I go, Mom, why are you watching all these shows? Are you taking notes? Hey, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a warning shot. Yeah. When you when you fill up the VCR with that stuff, it is it's a warning. You know. Dad, what are you doing? I'm mad at you. I'm about to DVR all this stuff. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, well that even falls into the old echo chamber, which mm -hmm. which you know Yeah. God, it's it's we all fall not we all, but it is it's it's so much easier and that falls into the fact that we don't like confrontation because yeah. we equated I'm being very general confrontation with being a really 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 bad thing and in confrontation mm -hmm. isn't con confronting or competitive it's you, you're an idiot because you don't agree with me it's like, right I mean, how do you reverse that and let's throw in this is there a way to will ai help or to make that worse I'm not sure because I suppose you can train your AI to be exactly what you want it to be. So have you heard about Replica, by the way? Replica with a K? No. But oh, gosh. So this is a rabbit hole that I fell down. There's an amazing YouTuber called The Internet Investigator who did an hour-long expose about Replica, which was initially created to be a mental health companion. But okay. rapidly showcase there are two different types of humans. So there are people who are using it as a coach to help them feel better, do better. And then they also added a subscription-based service where it could be your virtual girlfriend. And 
you know, you pay enough. Yeah, exactly. You pay enough money and all of a sudden you're having an affair with a chat bot. Uh, so it starts to, it starts to think about this idea of humans will always use technology in different ways. Like there will always be a good and an evil. There will always be humans who interact with these things to feed their basis instincts. So right, right. what does that look like? And what does that mean? What does that mean for relationships? Can you have an affair with AI? Ooh. Would your wife approve of you having an affair with AI? Yes. Wow. And what does that mean for the human experience too? Okay. There's, yes. Does it either degrade or does it just become part of? Wow. That's what I, you know, yeah. If we look at it relatively, yeah, it's degrading from our mm -hmm. standpoint, but three or four generations, right. that's how they grew up, which, you know, we look at it, come on, really? But, wow. And this kind of segues into what I've been waiting for and have not seen yet. All right, so go back to the v VHS versus beta. Remember? Yes. You may or not. What influenced the VHS? I know the answer. Yes. Yeah, I it was the adult it. industry. Porn drove yeah. the internet. It, mm -hmm. it, talk about it but it does and then see i don't see that yet with ai that's where well, okay wherever porn goes and and that's an interesting topic of you know the best technology isn't always the one that wins so when i was oh. hearing people talk about how you know microsoft is developing an ai and google has barred and all of these different things it's not always the best technology that wins. Sometimes it's the technology that has soaked into the human experience. The Facebook versus Google circles versus Google waves is a great example. All of those things may have, may have been better than Facebook, but we all understood Facebook and we had already decided it was our companion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's kind of where I see chat GPT right now because these competitors right. are coming up, but you know, I'm, I, learned a long time ago for some strange reason wherever i mm -hmm. go that's where it should be and then i just blah, blah, blah. i so myspace remember myspace i was mm. one of the first ones on myspace i think yeah. linkedin came out around this there mm -hmm. was overlap so i jumped yeah. on linkedin i was on linkedin myspace facebook maybe some other ones i don't remember yeah you know, but they all faded and then mm -hmm. linkedin blew up and yes now yeah like super duper blown up but um and it's interesting yeah. because their technology isn't the best. I see innovation in other platforms oh, in a yeah. huge way. I year this was before the pandemic. I went to a training at LinkedIn HQ in Chicago, right. which it rapidly turned into a user panel of like, hey, have you thought about marketing to hashtags like Twitter has? Or have you thought about on and on and on and on? And it just proves that like the best technology doesn't always win. It's the technology that's accessible, that has the most people, that has the most people talking about it too. I know, right. I know there are a million TikTok competitors, but do reels have the same panache as TikTok? I don't know. All right. As a marketer, how do you get that panache? Can you? And that's another, it's like, mm -hmm. here's the, for me, is there, is it demand creation or demand discovery? And that's a very valid question. Uh, and again, like the best thing isn't always going to win. It's going to be the thing that your friends are on. It's going to be the thing that your kids are on. It's going to be the thing that you see on the news. And like the 2020 comparison that your mom is talking about, that's a thing too. Like that is shaping how you think about the world. My mom was a 2020 viewer, which means I was never allowed to go on spring break because they knew what's happened on spring break. Everyone gets captured and kidnapped and end up in a desert somewhere when you go to spring break i know that I've seen the exactly break. i've watched enough 2020 to know what happens next are you kidding me nice. yeah. boy uh -huh. we talked about news to begin with but then I, and i so my father watches lester nbc mm. cbs I, yeah, yeah yeah and i feel like um i don't know if you remember um archie bunker archie bunker yes uh-huh uh i feel like meathead sometimes Mm. My dad is Archie, and yeah, I've, I've given up the battle. But I go, yeah, yeah this, this isn't news. And then every night, oh, we gotta watch less. Okay, so there's gonna be something about a tornado. There's gonna be something about a mass killing. There's gonna be something about this that. And then they're gonna end with some human thing. Oh, there's maybe an anti AI segment too. But there's gonna be some human feel good. And then Lester's gonna go off. 
and I, I even tried to get dad. There's only 17 minutes of news, and there's right. a whole day of people sitting around trying to figure out what to put into that three minute slot, or should we dedicate yep. eight minutes to this and 30 seconds to that? What's mm -hmm. why? And uh, well, we got yeah. we got to tell you how many millions of people are infected by this thunderstorm. Why? Again, the media doesn't tell you what to think. It tells you what to think about. So it is framing. Even in a 24-hour news cycle, there's a lot of things that don't get covered. And everything that you say yes to is something that you also say no to. And that really shapes our experience, you know? So let's go back. So with AI, mm -hmm. I believe that we're all going to have our own AI. Like, I want my MTV, I want my yeah. GPT. This is going to be the same thing, somehow. I don't know. The mechanics, I don't know. Maybe that's what I'd like, because I want my own, all right? So I want yeah. something to work with me and know me to a certain extent, right? But not, mm -hmm. not, not, in a, not in an effort to advertise to me what I know, whatever it is. I want somebody, mm -hmm. I want a machine who's going to know, okay, Greg likes this, he likes that, he likes that, but mm -hmm. he doesn't, whatever. Um, so is, I think that's an opportunity to actually take the power back or does it put everyone back into a silo in a vacuum? I don't, I don't know. Now, if I train my own AI to be like me, is that all I'm going to see? Unless I train my AI to be like me and I like to see other things, I, right? Because Well, and that's part of what Replica does is it yeah. responds the way that you talk to it. So you're basically building your perfect companion because they're your mirror image. And is that the human experience? I, I mean, there's there's a lot of things to digest there. And I think that what I talked about with West is that, in my opinion, the dream of any automation is that it frees up human intellect to do things that are far more interesting and rewarding. If I can figure out a way to make AI create my invoices and file my taxes and pay my bills, awesome. Yeah. I get zero joy from that. Let me figure out how to use humanity where it's worthwhile. Ooh, okay. That's the cream of the crop thought. Right. Exactly. There's a lot of steps that get to there. And it's going to take a lot. To get there and, uh -huh. and that asks an awful lot of humanity in general. The I mean, it, assume, it assumes that humanity wants to do those things too. It assumes that we want a higher calling not religious or anything like that, but we want to use our intellect to advance things. Wow. Is that all? Right. <laughs> I mean, I think it's an interesting concept. This idea of deus ex machina, God of the machine, like it starts to become a whole thing of like, what is humanity? That's what I love about all this. And I don't know, mm -hmm. some science, the, the, the closer they get to the... You know, the inside of a molecule is the closer you get to God. Somebody mm -hmm. said that. I don't yes. know. Yes. Uh -huh. but, but what I've noticed over time is the, the, the more discoveries we make in science and this mm -hmm. stuff, it's just a great big mirror. It is just, right. it's just like we forget yeah. about it and that, oh, wow. I mean, there's, there's circles that come back. I, so I don't know. Are you into the, or, or are you, how much exposure do you have to the, like the, uh, the zodiac signs and astrology and stuff like that? And, uh, it's I know I'm a Scorpio. Okay. Ooh. And that's about it. <laughs> okay. Right. I know that exists. <laughs> so, you know, of course, for thousands of years, that was science. Yes, it was. It was Alchemy science. was science. Yeah, exactly. So, whatever. So were gods and Atlas and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, are you familiar with the, the term, with the Aquarian age and the Pis you know, the age of Aquarius? Because I'm not, but I remember hair the movie came out and it talks about the it's a mm -hmm. bunch of hippies running around yeah. in, the, in the 60s and the age of aquarius okay mm -hmm. that was back in the 60s well we were in the if you and this only makes sense when you look back at it that's another thing. <laughs> it doesn't make sense out there but yeah. we look back at, oh yeah that makes sense so in the previous to the aquarian age the age of aquarius mm -hmm. uh, it was called the piscean and that was okay in, there was structure, and it starts like with Jesus Christ. Religion aside, let's just look at structure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, humanity needed structure. We needed nine to five. We needed a religion. We needed rules. Boom, boom, boom. Kings, kings, and queens would ev evolve to where we are right mm -hmm. now. But and then, if you look at the work environment, yeah, we needed you know 
schools to feed, work, yeah, five skyscrapers, blah 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 blah. And, and back then, there's going to be a day when we're going to have to break away from that into the age of Aquarius, which is more creative, more chaotic. Mm-hmm. The hierarchies fall, the structures dissolve, everything from religion to how you now. As I look back, it's like, well, that's what's happened. Astrologer, but you guys, this is what's happening, and, right? You know, that's what I said. It only makes sense if you look back at it. So, mm-hmm. but how do you? Uh, here's my question. So you've got um, the fear of COVID mm-hmm. that made everyone work from home. The remote work illuminated the redundancies and the stupidity of working at a company. The managerial la- layers were too much. I think what it really illuminated is that we were being judged on our adherence to a process, not the deliverables. Right, you go home. We were forced to go home and figure it out on our own, and now we're being mm-hmm. forced to come back. All right, so that eliminated one other thing. There's all this conflict that coming back to work. What is work? And then you throw AI into this whole mix because, right? You know, I had a not an argument, but a discussion with a CEO, and I asked, I, you know, well, it'll never. I go, yeah, it's going to replace C levels too. And he, he, what do you mean? I'm like, yes. Tell me what you do every day. Well. You know, I have this process. Boom. That's it. If you have a process, AI yep. can do this. And he was quiet for a few minutes. I go, oh, he got it. It's like, wow, yeah. So anyway, how do you – I mean, here's a big question. Where do you see society – well, no, let's bring it down to the work-from-home thing. Yeah. The, re- the remote work. How do you see AI impacting that, or is that mm-hmm. going to impact AI? Where, where do you sit on that? What do you think? Work is happening in all sorts of venues, and I think there are plenty of professions where it does not matter where you work. I think that this has been a revolution that's happening for a while. Um, The access to the internet, the jobs that rely upon the internet. You know, I was part of the generation where they said, if you find a, if you find something that you're passionate about, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, if that passion is spending time on the internet, there's plenty of jobs that do that now. So whether AI impacts that or not, I feel like there's a lot of tasks that exist in the modern corporate stack that can be automated, that can be included. And the C-suite thing is interesting to me because I feel like the further that you move on in your career, time-wise or ladder-wise, the more that you're managing people, the more that you're managing people's impact on one another, and therefore... The humanity aspect, I don't think AI can do. I think that the idea is that it frees us up. So one of the things that I was thinking about, I had, you know, a bar conversation with a friend who's a teacher. She's like, well, this is going to teach kids to read. They don't need me anymore. But if you've ever looked at a school, they need humans. Like these kids are, you know, biting each other and throwing things and trying to learn how to be humans in the world. You're not going to get that from a computer. Every profession has that kernel that can only be done by a human. And that's what I look to capitalize upon. Okay. A lot to digest there. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. But the, mm-hmm. So it's the human kernel. It's the kernel that's right. wrapped in layers and layers of stuff that can get peeled away. Because mm-hmm. Even the concept of school. Right. Right. I mean, if I go, yeah. back, I kind of alluded to it. School was in or school. The whole world, the word school is I don't know, Ukrainian or whatever. But you know, mm-hmm. there are some people that believe schooling was developed to make more workers, right? right. To get people ready to work in a cor- in a yep. capitalistic yep. society. Yep. To the, you know, Tasks that you do because school. you do them. Yeah. Right. Right. So that part is I don't know. It might that part of the nine to fiver is changing. So mm-hmm. the schools are going to have to change. And I think they right. will. Right. All right. So your teacher may not teach reading. I, I don't know about that, but or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But they're going to have to be there for something else. Or will I mean that whole wow? Will they? How do we? How do we do? Yeah. That? How do we? I mean, my generation very much focused on optimizing your childhood. Like, sure, you could go on play dates, but what if you did play dates with a mission? Or sure, you can join a club, but what if you join a club and you could put it on your college application? So there was that optimization that's happening. And I feel like we've reached a threshold when it comes to things like teaching the soft skills, media literacy, 
financial literacy. I mean, there are plenty of my peers that have six figures in college debt for what? So adding those things back in as appropriate, I think is going to be the next counter revolution. The pendulum swings left to right. And I yeah, think it's about to swing. Yeah. That's, and that would be good because I believe the whole not teaching kids financial responsibility or whatever is on purpose. I think that's part of the big, here we go, conspiracy. It's like, okay, if they don't know how to pay off a loan, then we're going to get mm -hmm. them all whatever kind of thing. We'll get them in easier. I, but, you know, and that's going to change too. The whole concept of money, holy crap. I mean, it could be a mm -hmm. Star Trek world. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know, but that's another thing. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. So, okay, so teachers could be less of the reading, writing, and arithmetic and more of the human skills, which right. would be great. <laughs> well, I mean, why do your kids go to preschool? They're not getting any usable skills cutting on the lines. They're, going they're to getting school because they're getting warehouse. So mom and dad could work their nine to five job. And they're getting the social skills. They're spending more time with peers as opposed to yeah. spending time with adults who have already mastered all of these skills that they need, you know, foundational knowledge in. Friendships are so much different. If you've ever spent any time with toddlers, they're like, you like pink, I like pink, we're best friends now. Okay. Yeah. It's not the same when you're right. 28, 38, 42. I don't like, I like pink. <laughs> All right. There we go. But we're yeah, friends now. So, yeah, that was easy. So yeah, done. Preschool could be, right. So it, it doesn't negate education. It, ed, it elevates it. It makes it even more important. I think it changes the way that we approach these things, because in my opinion, there's a lot of tasks that human intellect doesn't need to be applied to if we fully embrace te this technology universally. Right. right. I think the other thing to think about is there are plenty of industries that aren't worrying about AI because they figure it doesn't apply to them. And I can guarantee you, your employees are using AI, whether you're regulating it or not. So get a front of it. That's another. Yeah. Yeah. So Wes and I are trying to put together this regulation thing, which I hate mm -hmm. regs. I, you know, I guess yeah. it's AI anarchy. But I understand that we need, we, we're going to have to have something like that at, at the company level. At the company yes. level. I mean, you can't put your proprietary IP mm -hmm. in chat. Right. Because... Please don't do that. If you're doing that right now, please stop. Please go find who's ever doing this. If you're putting board notes or financials, like, please. Stop right now, go somewhere else and find somebody to stop. The financials. I know, which, oh which gosh. unfortunately, that's why I say we should have our own chat GPTs. If the, if, if right. Dow Chemical My own little own, pod. All right, uh -huh. fine. Just, and it's only going to stare at the data I put in. Then the financials are going into that, and that thing is mm -hmm. going to tell me where I've got weaknesses and all that. Yeah. The power of I, You're going to kind of have a, want it both ways, right? You're going to want to be able to have chat or whatever that AI is. Mm -hmm observe the outside world to get the best mm -hmm. of but yeah. share your stuff with the outside world. And I think that's important to think about. If you are yeah. using a product for free, you're part of that product. So that all of us true. that all of us that use social media, they are getting their half from it through advertisements because you know even cattle cows live for free. Yeah they do. They get a lot of food right up to the end. They live comfortably. Right until the end. So just understand if you're using a tool for free, sure, there's freemium versions of a lot of things, but the assumption is that you will be upsold. And if that's not the case, if every day that I log into Facebook, it's still there, there's a reason. Boy, ain't that the truth. I mean, Google is the original. I mean, uh, I could go on and on and on about yeah. that. I, I don't. I mean, what do you have? Mm -hmm. Everything is up there. Spreadsheets, documents, files, photos. Yep. For free. Mm -hmm. Yes. I work with a nonprofit and we have qualified for Google nonprofit, which gives us $10,000 of Google ads every month. How can they afford that? A couple of things to consider. First of all, it's not worth that much. And second of all, they're getting something on the back end of that. Absolutely. All that data from what nonprofits do and search for mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Crazy. Right. I love it. Um, mm hmm. Okay, big question then. Let's yes. See, where do we go with a big, big, big question? Oh, well, the whole, we did uh, state of fear. Yes. So.
So are you yes. familiar with that book by any chance? I am not. Tell me more about it. Is that backwards? Michael Crichton. He did Jurassic mm -hmm. Park and all that stuff. Yeah. This is this is an old book, so uh, I I read it a long time ago. And what he does is he takes real world contemporary science at the time, and then you know like Da Vinci Code and all that stuff. He he applies. Yeah. It. A lot of the good ones. Clancy did the same thing with warfare mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but this was a state of fear was what he, he was he was posturing climate control climate. And I don't even know if it was called climate change back then, but it mm -hmm. was back when it was even before Al Gore did his whole, you know, um, his whole thing. the PowerPoint presentation that he got a Nobel Prize for. Yes. That one, yes. The Nobel yeah. Prize. Huh? The hockey stick. The hockey stick. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it was a great study in the very beginning of media manipulation. And he's got some part in there that describes the changing of like for you know the cold war the soviet union when the mm -hmm. wall came down the soviet union was no longer our enemy we needed to find another enemy and he right. goes through and has a source you might know this or not has a source of how many times or uh, disasters certain words were used before then and then, mm -hmm. after then in the media and how it increased crisis and how, how the, thing, the word usage started to bubble up. And this whole thing about the book is about how climate control was, was, a, was made up by um, uh, you know, whatever, big corporations. And mm -hmm. and, uh, that, so then, then, then it goes off into fiction. Stuff. But the stuff he used to base his, his premise on was all based on facts. So he did the study and, and the journalism and, and how. Mm -hmm. so, so when I look at that, I, that, so I've got that as a foundation. I look at AI. What what's the state of fear with AI, right? What is yeah. I, I mean, I think it's very easy. Human nature fears the unknown. Period, and it doesn't matter what the unknown looks like. I mean, it can be as elemental as end of life, or it can be as elemental as new technology. And I think it's very easy. Fear is the default reaction. I think that it takes a certain level to overcome that fear. You know, we live in a generation where we have these devices on our desks that can tell us the weather for 10 days. That is something our ancestors would have only dreamed of to understand what is it going to look like on Tuesday? You know, it just didn't exist. So overcoming that fear and understanding that there is a companion to all of this and that there's useful propositions to it. I think makes a huge difference of how we approach this technology and whether we see it as friend or foe. So when you say there's a companion to what, mm -hmm. dive into that a bit, what do you mean by that? I think that there is so much that we can offload to these devices and to these activities that can really make our lives better, easier, and frankly, more enjoyable. And that, in my opinion, is the pursuit of happiness is understanding how we can use technology how we can use tools to optimize our happiness. Okay. And it could look like a million different things. Right. I was going to ask. You, so, so based on this, is it, are we on the path to utopia? Is there, I mean, I hadn't thought yeah. of it at all. I mean, mm -hmm. like I'll use Star Trek, right? There's no money. There's no famine. This is the, right. They, there was a utopian existence out there. And there's been plenty of other examples, but mm -hmm. I've never really considered it as a possibility. But I hear more and more people, you know, the four day work week. Yes. And, you know, they're going to take away all these jobs. But what are people going mm -hmm. to do? OK. Um, someone is talking more and more about universal, you know, when everyone gets paid. Universal income. Money. Yeah. 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 And that's starting to bubble up more and more. And at mm -hmm. first it's like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But then again, well, shit, we're not going to have to do anything. What do we do? With, I mean, you know, the right. Oil, will have to be something different. So does that segue into art? I mean, do we, does that? I think it does. Do we, I mean, art flourished in the Renaissance because of patrons and because of people that finance these things. Because if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you need to be able to eat and be safe and have clothing before you can self-actualize. So in the modern world, what does that look like? We need to have our basic instincts taken care of if we're going to think about things like unlocking the secrets of the universe. Right. Wow. So it is, I mean, 
I, I would agree with the statement if you think that mm -hmm. you say that this is the tip of that journey. Right. I, 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 you know, and I, I'm not, I'm more of a uh, catastrophic occurrence type thing, kind of. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I find it hard to even define a utopian existence, let alone the possibility of one. But now it's like, right. oh, okay, maybe. And it's something that I can't fit my head around. But that makes it mm -hmm. even more it's like compelling. It's like, well, that's usually what happens because you can't imagine it. And then all of a sudden it's there. So it, it's hard to consider because it's hard to consider because so few of us think about how to optimize joy. Well, we've been trained not to. Right. We've been trained to toil, hustle culture, you know, hustle culture. Don't even get me going. Yeah. On religion and you know, the whole you're guilty from the day you were born type stuff. That's if you rest, you rust. Yeah. That's our society. Yeah. Rest is so much. There's actually a book called Radical Contentment. It's about this idea of what does society look like if you're just fine with what you've got? Oh. Yeah. Our society isn't built on that. Our society no. is built on wanting more. Right. Now, so the question is, is that society or is that human nature? I mean, we've this is very philosophical more. then. Know, yeah, we've always wanted more. Right, right. So I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't know if there's mm -hmm. an end to that because there isn't that, that we want mm -hmm. more, but there are people that want more of what I have. Right. And they'll take it kind of stuff. So I don't know how we, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. It's crazy. I love it. Okay. So one last question. Mm -hmm. How do you see AI impacting art? What, is, what are your feelings on that? Even like visual, yeah. imagery, music, mm -hmm. all of it. Yeah. So I have a collection of AI headshots, which aren't actually me, but most of them look like me. Some of them look nothing like me. Some of them are generic brunette, middle-aged woman. But what I think that this means is that we are going to expect things differently from genuine artists. And we are going to be able to optimize our online existence using these things. I am so very grateful that I'm not dating in the world of AI. I'm just glad I'm not dating this time. No, it's crazy. Period. But also in the world of AI where headshots aren't real and people can be far more witty than they're entitled to with the assistance of ChatGPT. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, my belief is that ultimately once it's face to face, all that will melt away. The, the false right. things will, will go away, I hope. I mean, and that will only make it worse, I guess. Wow. Wow. Okay. So back onto the art thing. And this is where I'm yeah. from. I want, I want to get your opinion on this. So. So there was a time when copy, color copiers first came out. Mm -hmm. Office machine, I think there were cannons or color. There were artists in San Francisco that jumped on that. And yeah. They art, and they made right. copier art out of it. Now, I mm -hmm. about this until like two or three months ago. But, um, so I see two things. I see AI as another paintbrush, another color that hasn't been discovered that yes. artists can jump on and go for. And then there's also the, and I've, I've had arguments, not arguments, but discussions with other people about this. The art is about the interaction between the, the art and the observer, the beholder. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's cool to know that you know someone sat on it, you know, was on his back for six months painting the ceiling. The Sistine Chapel, yeah. And yeah, he cut half of his ear off, and that's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. But the art either resonates or it doesn't no matter what the backstory is. So my whole contention is, well, if it's created by a computer, but it still invokes an emotion, isn't that art? And I think that there's a huge philosophical debate to be told here. Do the stories matter if they're created by AI? Are the ideas any less valid if they're influenced by a computer? And I would say we're entering a new era. I'm sure that people thought the same thing. So there are people that create art through Excel. Is that not art? I feel like we need to broaden our spectrum of what we accept in these worlds because otherwise we sound like elitists. We sound like Luddites. Luddites. So yeah. there's a lot of options here. Interesting. So you're, you're not falling on one side or the other just yet on that. I mean, I wouldn't, but I'm curious, you know, you don't think it's a bad thing or it's a good thing. I don't think it's bad. I'm not willing to say it's a good thing yet. I have a quick, if, if, 
I universally don't think it's a bad thing. I think that it's opening up new avenues and it's opening up new venues for potential artists as well. And I am all about creating more avenues to creation. Right. I like that. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Wow. Okay. It's <laughs> half out at 530 or whatever. My time. Yeah. Well, listen, Kelly, I, I, I have more questions, but we're not going to ask. Well, we did talk about X-Files. We did. Kelly versus Bambi. I don't know if you remember who Bambi was. We'll get into that another episode. That was a great story. Yeah. Right, well, it's Friday evening. Hey, thank you very, very much for this. Of course. I appreciate it. It's a blast. Um, wow. Actually, this has been very good. I'm going to, I will actually re-listen to this because I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> this was a pleasure. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Excellent. Well, I'm just going to end it here. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye.